And if we were to go around this room, we would probably get a lot of reasons about where you'd want to go back to or why, and maybe the reasons would be maybe because it's comfortable, I knew what it was like then, um, things like that. Things about things that you're thinking about, like the good old days. And I was trying to think about my good old days, and uh, I'm not that old, but I do have some good old days. And uh, I was thinking, man, what could I, what could I go, really go back to? And I thought about a time after Bible college, I'd finished three years, and I had gone into the world of work, I guess. Working full-time, working eight till four, and I was thinking, man, that was a good, well, the time before that was a good time. Being at Bible college, being with, in a dorm with a bunch of guys, uh, first time away from home, has many, many fun aspects to it. You're learning lots, but also having a lot of fun. And uh, so that was, that was a good point in my, in my life. And now I'm going to this point where now I'm, I'm stuck in a job. And I was like, man, I wish I could go back. I wish I could go back to that. Now, it wasn't all that bad because during this time of work, I actually met, well, we had met before, but started dating Ange. So there was some good things in there. But uh, I did remember thinking during some of that point, I wish I could go back to that, to that point in my life. And when moving har- forward gets hard, often our desire is to look back sometimes. And these kind of thoughts can also come up in our relationship with Christ. When moving forward gets hard or stressful or scary, the desire to go back sometimes can be there. Because what we've already experienced doesn't require any faith. We've been there, we've done that. Moving forward actually requires us to trust God uh, on his promises, not on our past life experiences and not on our own efforts. Pastor and author Todd Wilson writes, turning back leaves us powerless to move forward. Why? Because when we return to our former way of life, we find it doesn't actually provide us with greater strength and freedom to help us move forward. In fact, it's just the opposite. We find we're back in bondage to what once held us captive. And the Galatian Christians to, in what we're looking at today had turned back to similar practices. They had gone back to what they were doing in the past. Maybe because it was familiar. Maybe it was because it was what they'd known. And in the past weeks, we looked at how we've come from slaves to sons and daughters of Christ. And now we're kind of looking back how this church is wanting to go back to these former, this former way of life. And one of the main ideas in this passage is when we forget our identity in Christ, we have to turn to idolatry, which puts us back into slavery. So we're looking at Galatians 4, and we're looking at verses 8 through 20. I'm not going to read all the verses. There's a lot in these verses. Uh, I'm not going to read them all right now. We'll go through them. But there is, uh, there is a lot packed into this. And so we'll, we'll pick up and we'll go through a few verses at a time. So Galatians 4, 8 through 20 it says, formerly when you did not know God. So this is pre-salvation. This is pre-knowledge of Christ, pre-conversion of Christ. You were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you've come to know God, or rather be known by God. Now I'm going to stop there because Paul makes a very subtle little change here. When he's writing with the church, to the church in Galatia, He's not even going to relent for even for a second against the notion that we are in some way sufficient for our own salvation. He's not going to give them the fact that, he's not going to give them, you know what, I found God. No, actually, rather, God found you. And so again, as we've seen throughout this book of Galatians, he kind of attacks their self-righteousness in almost, in, in many areas of this book. And as we've gone through this over the last several weeks, and he gives us no ground for you and for me to believe our, our, our salvation, our right standing before God has anything to do with us, but rather has everything to do with, with him. <clears throat> if we look, if we continue on with the verses 8 through 11, it says, So formerly when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, How is it that you're turning back to those weak and miserable forces or principles you'll hear or elementary principles you'll hear in other translations? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? 
You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I've wasted my efforts on you. Now Paul is, he's kind of creating a bit of a, kind of a scary situation here. Because the Galatians, before they were converted to Christ, they are enslaved to what he called these elementary forces or these elementary principles. Or, you know, or gods who were not really gods. Now what we know about this, the phrase elementary principles is, a, is it's a reference to um, like demonic spiritual forces. So in the ancient world, you know, you kind of attributed to the elements of nature by satisfying maybe uh, an ele- uh, a spiritual force of that kind. So for example, if you were a farmer and you needed rain, you would appease the god who would give you, who controlled the rain who, in order to do that. If you wanted to become pregnant, you would maybe go visit the fertility god, and so on and so on. You have these different gods. You go to make sacrifices um, and get stuck in these kind of rituals that to get what you think you could get from this, this god. But Paul is saying these gods are not gods. They're elementary principles. They're elementary forces, which means there's, there are spiritual forces at play here behind our idols. And the reality of this, and Paul's pointing this out, is that these spiritual powers cannot deliver on what they promise. And they cannot deliver on, pro- their, on what they promise because ultimately they're not sovereign, they're not powerful, they can only do what they're allowed to do. If we look at the story of Job, many of you are familiar with the story of Job. Uh, he was an, an upright guy who had many blessings from God. He was close, he was, he was um, yeah, he was, he was a great model to to strive after in his relationship with God. And so Satan and God are kind of having this conversation. You know, I bet you he wouldn't worship you if I took these things away from him. And God was like, well, okay. You're allowed to do some of these things. Now, as as we go through the story, a lot of these things are taken away from Job. And he doesn't curse God his wife and his friends are, are saying, you know, curse God and die. He's like, he's like no, we're not, I'm not going to do that. So he's, he's going through this, this time and trial of his life, but he doesn't... Um, <clears throat> the, the point of it is Satan is only allowed to do what he's allowed to do, what God allows him to do. He's restrained in that fact. And Job goes on living more of a full life than he probably would have if Satan wasn't there to wound him, to take some of those things away from him. So an illustration of these these weak and miserable principles that the churches in Galatia were, were turning to is found in verse 10. It says, you're observing special days, months, seasons, and years. Now they're planning these things, um, weekly Sabbath, Uh, monthly moon festivals, annual festivals like Passover. And they must have been led to believe that their observance of these days, of these special events, would actually draw them closer to God. And it was foolish to think that because how could a people who have already received adoption as children of God and are praying, Abba, Father, in the spirit, people who know God and are known by God start to depend on the observance of these holy days for their relationship with God. Because Jesus came so that he can bridge the gap between us and God. And these things that they're observing were never meant to save us. And isn't it this obviously a return back to those weak and miserable principles that characterized their lives before? Author and pastor Tim Keller writes, If anything but Jesus is a requirement for being happy or worthy, that thing will become our slave master. Without the gospel... We must be under the slavery of an idol. Are there things that we include with Jesus to help save us? And about this text is if there are things in our lives, if you're here because this morning because attendance somehow keeps you in right standing with God, attendance to church keeps you in right standing with God, or somehow God God saves you because of that, then you're brought into some of these, this belief system that these principles we're not meant for salvation. If you think, if you think about that's, that's kind of one aspect of, of Tanzanian culture. Another part of it is what about if, if you're giving 
tithing, for example. Does our right standing with God depend on how much we give? And such, there are situations in Tanzania where depending on how much you give determines where you're sitting in church. These are some of those things that according to the text, these are some of those elementary principles that we're becoming enslaved to. But what Paul is saying is that you're in the same boat when you're trying to use these standards as a means of salvation. Now, church attendance is great. Going to life group is great. They help us become more like Christ. But if we use them as a method of salvation, we're enslaved to something that cannot deliver on what it promises. If we move on to verse 12, it says, Now all of a sudden, he's saying, Brothers, he says, Brothers, I plead with you. I beg you. He says, I plead with you, brothers and sisters, become like me, for I became like you. And Paul had this habit in his writings of saying something similar to this in his throughout different areas of scripture. Things like, follow me as I follow Christ. So I'm going to fix my eyes on Jesus. I'm going to follow Jesus. You follow me while I follow Jesus. And you have the same kind of rhythm going on here. But I think his point actually gets a little bit deeper than that. He's trying to encourage them to walk in the freedom that he's walking in. And Paul had this down. The challenge challenge to become like me is needed because they're not like Paul. Because they're giving into this persuasive teaching of the law teachers. This was mentioned a few weeks ago by Mark, by Sheshi. They're giving into this, this persuasive teaching of the teachers of the time because they've been preoccupied with getting circumcised in order to belong to God's people and using Jewish law to guide their lives. They're drifting from the devotion to Christ, their, their devotion to Christ. And so to to us, it may seem presumptuous or even risky, actually, for Paul to challenge people to imitate him in order to draw them back to Christ. Because most of us rather say, don't follow me, follow Christ. We're too aware of of our inconsistencies. We're too aware of the sin in our life to say, follow me. But he said, as he said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, follow my example as I followed the example of Christ. Paul was well aware that the imitation of Christ needs to be illustrated in the experience of our peers. And without our peers to show us this, or even a mentorship relationship to show us this, what it means to follow the Christ in our world, imitation of Christ often seems like an unattainable goal. But when someone like ourselves gives us a living model to follow, we may have that tangible realizable pattern to guide us. And I think mentors are important in our lives. I never had a specific mentor growing up in my life all the way up. I, my parents were great. Um, they raised me well, but I never had that mentorship relationship from someone outside of, that, of, of the family. And I think there's lots of opportunity for us here in the school and other places to have to come along someone side by side and walk them through relationship with Christ. I wish I did. I think I would have learned a lot from having a mentor in my life growing up. And I think there are some here that are young enough, a lot of them left for youth, but there's a lot here that could use a mentor to come alongside them to walk them along um, the life of, of being a Christian. So here's what Paul's saying. There's freedom Come to freedom. Don't be enslaved to that. There's freedom to be had. Come where I am. I've been where you are. It doesn't work. We've seen it before. It says, be like I am. I've been where you are. It's not going to work. It's enslavement. It's different things like that. It doesn't bring joy. It doesn't bring freedom. Come to Jesus. And with Paul, I was reading a quote from Matt Chandler this week. He says, with Paul, you couldn't touch. You couldn't touch Paul. He says, if you threaten to kill him, to die is gain. If you're going to leave him alone, to live is Christ. If you want to beat him up to get him to stop talking, he, would count, he wouldn't count the present sufferings of this world as worthy to be com- compared to the future glory. If you put him in a dungeon, he would sing hymns and, and convert all your guards. He was literally a man who you couldn't touch. 
Now look where he goes in this next part of his text here. Paul gives reasons to follow his example. Paul's identification with the, with the Gentile Galatians. If we look at 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 22, it says, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those not having the law, I became like the one not having the law so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak. To win the weak, I become all things to all men so that by all possible means, I might save, I might save some. And it really is extraordinary to see how Paul identifies with people to help win people over for Christ. And I think the same practice of identification is necessary today. If we're going to communicate the gospel effectively to people, we need to put ourselves in that place. Experience their joys and sorrows. Be in community with one another. If we want people to become like us in our commitment to Christ, then we must become similar to them. Be in community with them. What does community look like? How does community look like here at church? Well, it means coming. That's great. It means coming to different things. Maybe it's part of a life group. Maybe it's coming to this ladies thing coming up. But it's, it's being in community. It's, it's coming alongside others, sharing similar experiences. When we're not in community, we become isolated. And what does that lead to? Lots of things. There shouldn't be lone rangers in Christianity because God is community. And when we live amongst others who are spirit-filled, it keeps us away from the process of, of slavery, what he's talking about. We'll continue on in verse 13. It says, As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. And there's been a lot of speculation on what this illness was. Um, a lot of commentaries, commentators would say it's, it was something to do with his eyes, and that's kind of supported later on in verse 15. Um, but the, the issue is not really what illness Paul had, is, but the fact that he had something, and he continued to do what he was doing despite whatever illness this was. Um, we shouldn't let all the, you know, the speculation of this illness distract us from what actually what Paul was doing. And it's common to view um, illness as a hindrance to preach the gospel or an excuse not to do so, to do it, our duty. But Paul realized that he says in the letter to the Corinthian church that God's grace is sufficient for us in our weakness in fact, that God's power is best expressed through our weakness. If we go down to verse 15 and 16, and there's kind of a contrast here in verses 15 and 16. It says, Where then is your blessing of me now? I can testify that if you have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Now, this is a dramatic shift from the Galatians' warm welcome from him before to now their cold rejection of Paul a little bit later on. And this could be, kind of serve as a, uh, as a reminder to us in our relationships or a reminder to us in our churches. In fact, teaching the truth, as Paul's saying here, was always going to run the risk of alienating some people. People in the church need to be aware of of truth being told because sometimes it really does hurt a lot. And I've been involved in a church in the past where there was um, preaching from the Bible is, is what the church was doing and uh, this person ended up leaving the church um, and, I, and I saw or I had heard later on the reason why this person had left the church is because, well, because they taught too much from the Bible. They taught too much truth from the Bible. And really, I was shocked at that. But really, it's a great testimony to that church. If you're preaching the word from the Bible, if you're preaching truth, and people are getting offended by that, and they want to leave, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great testimony from the church when you are able to preach the truth in that way. We went on to verses 17 through 20, the last four verses here. 
It says, those people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. What they want is to alienate you from us so that you may have zeal for them. It is fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good, and to be so always, not just when I am with you. My dear children, from when... For whom I am again in the pains of childbirth, childbirth until Christ is formed in you. How I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I am perplexed about you. Now here's one of the make markers of being a possibility of a slave, a slave enslavement to religion instead of freedom that comes in, in Jesus Christ. You don't want to hear what's true. So, what I, so here's what I know is reality for many of us. We come here today and maybe there are legitimate difficulties in our lives. Some of us maybe are in marriages that are hard, maybe in some financial situations that are maybe crushing, uh, loved ones who are sick, maybe children who are gone wayward. And here's what would be easy to say in life in Christ. If you would just submit your life to Christ, all that's going to go away. You know, there'd be no difficulties in your marriage, there'd be no problems that you're experiencing, all that's going to be going away. And maybe I'll bring out a text about God's, God's blessing or something like that. And you'd leave kind of feeling kind of happy in some ways. But that wouldn't be cutting to the, to the truth. Now, is God able to accomplish more than we can ever dream or imagine? Absolutely. Can he restore, heal, and heal marriages? Yes, he can. We've seen him do it many times. Can he lead us out of financial ruin? Yes. Can he heal diseases? Yes, he can. But is that why we go to him? If that's why we go to him, then what we want is not him, but rather those things that he does for us, and that's idolatry. So how do we know if we're enslaved or if we're walking in the gospel? People who have a heart that's been captivated by the gospel, they want to know Jesus. And Paul's language here says, He's kind of in anguish. He says, until, until what? Until Christ is formed in you. What does he want? He doesn't want them to look to him even though he said, become like I am. He wants them to know Jesus, follow Jesus, worship Jesus. The contrast between Paul and these rival teachers during the time here is their, mo- their motive is to attach the Galatians to themselves so they'll be the center of attention. And Paul labors to attach them to Christ so that the full character of Christ will be expressed in him. And Paul's personal appeal, become like me, must be interpreted in the light of this contrast. It's not simply a demand for attachment to Paul, but it expresses his longing for the Galatians to be able to declare wholeheartedly with him, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And regardless of what we could bring up, marriage, family, work, there are truths about us that we may not want to hear. And the Word of God is going to expose those. It's going to cut into those to reveal those things in our lives that would enslave us rather than fix ourselves on the, on the Holy Spirit. So how do we respond to truth? Would we rather have our ears kind of tickled a little bit? Would we rather hear what's true and allow the Holy Spirit to, to work in that and stir that up? Because it can be ugly sometimes. And it doesn't matter what part of our life we're talking about. It can be ugly when you see shortcomings in our lives or we see weaknesses in our lives or idolatry and we actually see who we are. It can be an ugly thing, but we have to keep in mind that grace and mercy and forgiveness of Christ is always quickly behind that revelation. If we go to verse 20 as we're closing off here this morning. So this is myself when I'm, when I'm talking about this as well. When he's talking about being perplexed. Um, right there. <clears throat> How I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I am perplexed about you. And so I think at times, I was thinking about this word perplexed and I kind of fall into this, this trap sometimes because I'm, I'm perplexed 
at some of my own actions. And Paul was perplexed at the Galatian church. Because I was wondering, I was thinking about why do I look so much like, or why do we look so much like the culture that we see around us? How much of our culture is in us and not like Jesus Christ? I was kind of perplexed at that in my own life, how, I, how we just look at our culture and just how it's part of our lives. Why do I, and I was kind of perplexed as well at some of the students at school where I see... Um, Christian students who are the exact same as some of their non-Christian friends. And I was kind of perplexed at that. I'm like, why, why is that? Why is it that the music that we listen to or the movies or the language or the relationships all look very similar? And, and Paul is really perplexed by them doing some of these things. And maybe you're in your life, you're kind of perplexed at some of those things as well. Why? Maybe sometimes in my own life, why isn't there a fervency of, of worship and prayer in my own life? Maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you're kind of wondering, why, why don't I have that burning passion sometimes when I'm worshiping? Or maybe today, as we're thinking about this, this perplexed in our relationship with Christ, yeah, why, why am I not experiencing the fullness of Christ in my own life? Why don't I have that fervency? And, and Paul was clearly frustrated at this. And I was thinking, man, I'm kind of frustrated in my life as well about this sometimes because I fall short so many times. And Christ is there to, to cover that. But I fall short and, I'm, and, I, and I am perplexed. I'm like, why, why do I not get to the point where I want to get to sometimes in my relationship with Christ? Maybe today for the first time you realized, man, I'm definitely enslaved to these, these elementary principles that he was talking about in the, in the verses before. I'm enslaved to things that have not brought about joy or brought about gladness in Christ, not things that haven't not set me free. So I'm busy, I'm, I'm busy religiously, but still trapped and enslaved to you know, a practice that doesn't really live, bring life or freedom. There's that aspect as well. Or there's the aspect of truth. Can I hear the truth in my own life? Can I hear there are true things about my own life that may be hard to hear? Do I have someone to come alongside me and, and point some of those true things out in my own life saying, hey, what about this? What about that? Do I have someone who comes alongside me to say those things in my life so that they can be worked on, so that I can grow in Christ? Or what are we still referring to in our own lives? Because there's Jesus, and maybe there's this. And as Tim Keller had, had, had mentioned before, we don't need both. We need, we need Jesus. So what are we still referring to in our lives besides Jesus to help us with our, to make us think that we're in better relationship with him? My hope is that the, the Holy Spirit would expose some of those and engage in ways and this in ways this morning that helps us set us free. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this word this morning. Lord, we just pray against some of these principles, Lord, that we can be entrapped to, enslaved to, that aren't following what you want for our lives. Lord, we pray for uh, the truth in our lives that we need to hear, that we need to have people come alongside us and tell us these things so that we can grow in you, Lord. We need those people amongst our lives. And Lord, what are we referring to in our lives um, besides you to think that we are in right, in right relationship with you because of this? We pray, Lord, that you will expose those to us so that we can be in right relationship with you. We just pray these things in your, in your name. Amen.